Well, greetings and uh, welcome to the uh, second part of our Christian engagement of secular humanism. We will have uh, a total of four parts to this series of lectures. And uh, we'll continue where we left off from the last time. Let me share the screen with you and we'll get moving. We left off last time. We talked about uh, does God give us a roadmap of life's journey or do, is it more like a compass? And I, I put forward the idea that uh, it's more like a compass and uh, uh, God gives us direction saying, follow me, follow my son. And, uh, you know, wherever we are in life, whatever roads we've gone, with some of them we might not should have taken or others where you just uh, decide to do something uh, we probably shouldn't have done. But we can always go back to following the direction of Jesus. And the compass is always pointing us that way from a biblical worldview perspective. So now we're going to move on to uh, the context of the early Christians who did have Jesus as their compass and they they showed it in how they were committed to him and how they lived their lives. So as we think about the the Roman Empire, it was very diverse ethnically and religiously, uh, much more pluralistic than our society in the U.S. is today. Uh, however, they didn't have secular humanism uh, like we do. Almost everyone believed in the spiritual dimension and a physical dimension. A few philosophers got close, but most of them didn't throw out the idea of uh, supernatural beings, gods, uh, in the process uh, completely. So they may have no ignored them, but didn't throw them out completely. Uh, Christianity came into the world uh, that, whose moral standards were very low relative to uh, Christian uh, teaching. And uh, and so uh, we we have to remember that they had to navigate a a, a world that uh, had uh, moral ideas that were contrary to Christian teaching. Everything from infanticide to exposing children uh, to uh, sexual morality of every kind, not much different than uh, we see uh, today. Uh, may have been much more open uh, than it is in our even in our society, um, but um, they had to make a difference in the midst of all this diversity, mor morality, ethical, economic, and political challenges that were there, and they came into a system, uh, a time period where the Roman Empire uh, ran everything, and you know if they took a disliking to someone or a particular group of people, they would persecute them as they did uh, the early Christians. So they were living in the midst of this diversity and different values uh, and different worldviews than their own uh, in the midst and being persecuted on top of it uh, for, the, for their beliefs. Uh, Christianity started in AD 30 at Jesus' death and by AD 350, uh, it is estimated that approximately 60% of the empire uh, were Christians. Uh, and uh, the person who pointed this out, and I, I haven't seen anybody really challenge his figures on this, was Rodney Stark in his book, The Rise of Christianity. And it just shows how fast Christianity grew, even uh, in the midst of uh, persecution. But persecution oftentimes makes something stronger, and those who stick it out, uh, they're stronger in their faith than they would be otherwise. And the these people would continue to share the faith so that it actually uh, permeated the whole of the Roman Empire. And a lot of the values and the worldview began to be changed by the influence of Christianity. Um, so Christians, as an example, uh, they centered on Christ. Uh, how much he valued humanity and realizing that God created humanity in his image. But so for them, humans were ultimate value. In the Roman Empire, humans were, you know, not highly valued. Human life was cheap and particularly human life that wasn't among the elite. 
of uh, the political world and are the wealthy of the world or something like that. And so they ministered to uh, everyone, but uh, you know they were unique in how they took care of the poor and the sick and so forth. And because they centered on Christ, Christ was concerned for those who are weak and poor and uh, sinners. Uh, and so Christians lived their beliefs, uh, centered on Christ, they followed his teachings and they lived them out this is, of course, what gets them persecuted as well, because they didn't recognize uh, Caesar as one of the uh, gods. Uh, and uh, oftentimes they were thought to be atheists. They, you know, people say, well, you don't believe in the gods, so you must be atheists. And uh, all kinds of things. They even got tagged as cannibals at times. And, you know, you can read about this in uh, early Christian history. But they lived their beliefs, and then they recognized Christ's attitude and emulated them. They they looked to him, how he cared for people, how he took care of the sick, how he uh, uh, helped uh, everyone, and how he taught the gospel uh, to people. And so, um, you know, they shared uh, their beliefs within and outside their own communities. And that's why it spread uh, so rapidly. Down here at the right corner, you can uh, see here the uh, uh, a picture, a painting of Christians uh, in the uh, Colosseum where they're thrown there. Sometimes they would be attacked by gladiators or by wild animals in there uh, for, this, for the fun of the spectators. Uh, here, this one's in 2010, a picture of a terrorist attack on a, a, a Christian uh, church uh, in a part of the world that is, was, is mostly non-Christian uh, and has a, uh, uh, and so they're being persecuted uh, as a minor group that went against the majority. Uh, so uh, when we think about uh, sharing their beliefs, uh, they, uh, you know, they were doing this with self-sacrificing love, and they knew that following Jesus could cost them their lives, uh, but they believed, you know, uh, we should follow Jesus that strongly. So even when there was uh, a plague where people get sick with various disease that was communicable, Christians wouldn't run away. They, like others, they would stay and minister to them. And most of the plagues are, were of the type of sickness that, if you you know could minister to the person, they could get better. But uh, they had limitations on uh, that. And some Christians died taking care of the sick and during the plague time. In fact, one of the uh, early Christian writers, uh, uh, post-apostolic writers wrote, they were no less martyrs, the ones who took care of the sick, than those who died in the Colosseum. Um, so they practiced mercy, sought justice, and they lived uh, faithfulness, faithfully. Um, they adhered to living in peace, even at their own expense. Uh, they, uh, early Christians do not generally uh, serve in the, the military. Uh, it's not enjoined in scripture that they shouldn't, but their practice was not to serve in the military because they felt like it's better to try to save people's lives through teaching them the Christian faith rather than killing them. Um, so, but they tried to live in peace with everyone they could. And they engaged in overcoming things like infanticide, exposing children. They'd even they'd even take them in their own home and raise them uh, opposed to even even early on they opposed abortion so if we think the deal today and right now we just recently had Roe v. Wade to overturn which has caused an uproar uh, but again for Christians uh, being opposed to abortion has a long history right back to the very beginning of its uh, movement because it's just the human life is uh, you know made valuable by God's it has intrinsic value because God created humanity in his image whether the human is in the womb or not uh, so uh, this continued to be a way that Christians viewed their 
uh, morality and uh, uh, oppose such things. Uh, held to a higher standard of morals and marital fidelity. This was not in their day. Uh, we think it's bad today. It, it was no doubt worse during their time. Uh, and, uh, you know, and it was not an equal standard. If a woman committed adultery, uh, she could face huge consequences when the man didn't face any really consequences. Uh, but if the woman uh, would register as a prostitute, even though she's married, uh, if she is committing adultery then, but she's registered a prostitute, she can get by with it. Things like that, things we don't even think about with what went on uh, during this time that uh, don't even go on today. Um, as I mentioned earlier, serve the sick in times of plague that we talked about. Uh, labor was made legitimate. Uh, you know, a lot of slavery during this time. Uh, it's estimated maybe 60% of uh, Rome was made up of slaves. In Greece, it was higher percentage than that. They were the, the ones that did the manual labor and they really didn't get, they were owned and uh, it wasn't until Christians came along and they started legitimizing labor uh, and saying, well, don't have slaves. And they fought against slavery and, and uh, as Paul notes in his letter to Philemon, you know, and Christians would move away more and more from having slaves, and then whatever work they do, they, they would, as the Bible says, you know, uh, he should do workers worthy of his wages. And uh, so more of uh, labor came in to be legitimate work and not just something slaves do. Uh, offered a belief system of love and hope. Um, and so, uh, unlike uh, the gods and goddesses and how they manipulated humans for their own enjoyment uh, and other philosophies, they didn't really deliver uh, hope and certainly didn't promote a self-sacrificing love. And that was something that Christianity continues to offer that uh, other belief systems do not. Started schools for the common people um, early on by the second century. There were a number of uh, schools, uh, and these were founded by some of the church leaders. And they were more like schools for missionaries. They would train people and teach them. But uh, these would later develop as when after the persecution time and. Constantine, Edict of Milan in 312, Christianity was again legal, and uh, they could openly have uh, all kinds of schools, and out of the uh, different locations where they had churches, they would offer school to both uh, the girls and boys, uh, which was not common at all. Mainly, education was for the males uh, in that. So a lot of things were going on in these first few centuries that would impact the world for a, a long time to come. Uh, to this day, we have hospitals named after religious groups. The, our school system, the public school concept came into being through a uh, Christian uh, background. Our early universities in the U U.S. were all built by uh, Christian groups, uh, uh, at least uh, in the Protestant, or at least 15 of the first 16 were. Um, and so we we have to realize that um, what went on back here and how the Christians lived became a standard and uh, paved the way for later Christians to to ex follow the, their example, which of course they were following Christ's example as best they could in their society. So uh, the foundation of uh, Christian living. Uh, and engagement uh, is very important. That how do we articulate the very foundation of uh, our Christian living, uh, from which we engage the world around us? Which in this case, uh, for Christians in the U.S., the secular humanist perspective, uh, you're going to run into that more than you're going to run into somebody from a particular religion, uh, like we've been saying in the world religions in this course. 
uh, you know, Islam, maybe 2%, somewhere around there. Um, Hinduism, probably less in this country. Uh, you know, Judaism, a little bit more. But they they make up a very small percentage. We're on a secular humanist perspective. We're going to run into that more and more. And percentage-wise, there's more people out there that would adhere to that than to any one of those uh, religions. And so we need to look at the foundation of that. Uh, first uh, part of the foundation is everyone's created in the image of God. So the, every person, whoever they are, whatever they believe, however they live, they have intrinsic value in God's sight. Uh, they're made, every person is made in the image of God and of equal value in God's sight. So we have to, in our foundation of Christian living, we have to value all people as God does. And God loves, uh, has love for all people. For God so love the world, we'll come back to the passage in John 3, 16, that he gave his only son. Uh, so uh, God's love for humanity, for his creation, the one he created in his image, his unique creation, uh, has that intrinsic value and he has love for that, for that. And thus, we, as part of our foundation, Christian living, have to have a love for all of humanity, even loving our enemies, which we'll talk about later too. Uh, Christ died for all people. And so that tells us that uh, Christ's love for people, uh, that he's willing to go across for people. That's how much he cares about people. And so this becomes a major aspect of our foundation. Part of that, too, is Jesus uh, talking about the two greatest commandments. Uh, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Those are the two greatest commandments. And he even says uh, in one of the passages, you know, uh, on the, this, all the law and the prophets, you know, exist. In other words, if you take all the laws that 600, what is it, 19 and 13, uh, and, uh, you know, they're either going to have to do with your relationship with God or relationship with others. Uh, with the prophets taught, it will either have to do with your relationship with God or relationship with others. Uh, so, um, so the implications of the two greatest commandments is there's, there is a spiritual dimension, God, and, uh, but there's also this physical dimension, our interaction with each other. And so, uh, the world needs to experience Christ's love and concern for others. And so this becomes foundation, part of our foundation as uh, as we move forward to discussing, you know, how do we engage in the secular humanist world we're existing in more and more. Uh, also, uh, you can do the, look at the golden rule, Luke 631, and as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. Uh, or as you've heard it, probably do unto others as you have them do unto you. Uh, the point being is that uh, these are these are ways of living uh, and attitudes which we have to develop and strengthen as Christians, uh, and uh, they make up this foundation uh, that uh, from that we can engage the world uh, like the early Christians did. Well, uh, and when we engage the world, we're on, and this means uh, we are continuing Christ's mission. Christ came and uh, he uh, he was God who came in the flesh and says, you know, hey, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Uh, and he represents God. And he is God that says, I'm going to communicate to you who I am by coming in the flesh. So that uh, this is the best way humans can understand because if they can see it in their own reality and, uh, and God puts himself in that reality as Christ and basically teaches us, you know, who he is. And so um, he, Jesus says this is, his mission was to come and to, to uh, reveal God and his will to people and to die on a cross so that people could have salvation through faith uh, and God's grace and uh, through faith. 
And so uh, uh, that means uh, when Jesus died, he also said, now my followers will carry this on. And you see a lot of this. He prays about it in John 17. You have the Great Commission statements and so forth on that. So the mission originates with God. God has always been a God of mission in which he's always reaching out and communicating to his to humanity to show his will although oftentimes humanity has rebelled or and people have because of the freedom that god gives us we can say no to what god offers but the mission is always there and it originated originates with god and god loves his creation otherwise he wouldn't be always trying to draw it back into the right relationship with him and uh, making that relationship known and of course his followers have to to make that known uh, but we also have to have the love for his creation as well and and uh, god's people can't neglect it he he didn't make this you know if you want to he, he said he gave a command go into all the world and make disciples go to pantata ethne is the greek go to every ethnic group it can be translated and uh, and so, of course, Christianity has been doing that throughout the centuries, and all of us are called to where, where we're at to represent Christ. And we may not become a missionary and go, you know, to deep, dark Africa, as they say, which uh, my wife and I uh, worked in the area of East Africa. But, uh, you know, but there's always uh, things that people need to hear the good news right next door as well. Uh, we can't neglect this, and God will equip his people. In other words, uh, God says, I'm going to be with you, and uh, he's there with us as we share uh, that message of love and hope with other people. Um, love is God loves by loving God and our neighbor, so that those two greatest commandments, they keep coming up again and again, because uh, everything rests on these, that you know, our attitude, uh, first our relationship with God, then our attitude towards others. And uh, these, ha these have to be there uh, for us to be effective uh, in, uh, in reaching out to others and engaging with people who have a different worldview than our biblical worldview or have a lifestyle totally different from our lifestyle. And, uh, and and the list could go on, but uh, we we have to realize that you know uh, we also have have the idea to love ourselves, love others as we love ourselves. There's the self love too, and we we need to have that, but uh, not a selfish self love. It's uh, it's an attitude that uh, permeates out to other people, and they're working for their good. Uh, concern for spiritual and physical well-being of others, which Jesus, uh, you know, exemplified, and early Christians uh, continue to do that. Christians are some of the most involved people in this, not only talking about spiritual matters, but also in developing, helping in the physical world as well. Uh, and they spend trillions, Christians spend trillions of dollars uh each year to in all kinds of concerns uh that have to do with everything from helping with medical care to clean water to farm and improve farming you, the list could go on and on and on uh yeah, you know it's been claimed by second humanists sometimes that we're so concerned with the spiritual realm as christians that we we neglect the physical and that's really not true at all, and uh, uh, I think it was uh, C.S. Lewis who said his experience was that those who are most concerned for the spiritual world are also those who are most concerned for the physical world, and I think he, he is quite right about that. Uh, service uh, in a manner that represents Christ's service, so ultimately we want to represent uh, Christ in what we do and how we do it, and our attitudes and so uh this is all part of you know the basis for our engagement uh with whoever we're talking here mainly about secular humanism but if you're working among any other person which has a different worldview or a different religion uh, same thing would carry over 
All right, uh, Christian thinking and worldview. Uh, we have to re remember, as we've emphasized throughout this course, so open rather than closed system. Uh, there's a physical, but there's also a spiritual dimension. However, the physical dimension, the spiritual dimension is being downplayed. Secular humanism wants to remove it from reality and saying, well, it's not really real. It's a, a subjective uh, subconscious thing that uh, you impose that's not really real. Or you may just have a neurotic need for a father figure or whatever it is to have a God. Uh, that kind of thing is there. And uh, but it, we do uh, the biblical worldview is that there, there is both a spiritual, physical dimension to the world and to individuals. Uh, God created when He created humanity. Uh, there is a concept of objective authority. God says, "Here's uh, here's some guidelines," and uh, and there's a concept of truth. Jesus says, "I am the way, the truth, the life." Uh, Truth is not relative from a biblical worldview. Uh, it doesn't mean we fully understand it all the time or we totally live by it all the time, but uh, it's there. And then uh, there's the reality of evil. Uh, some people even um, um, philosophers have said, you know, uh, you know, want to reason away that reality is really real. Um, but you, you really can't live very long and not really be hit by evil and realize, you know, I think it's really real. Uh, and the value of the person, uh, which is intrinsic because God created them that way, and then the value of the sacred, to realize that we have to value the, the spiritual realm as well as our physical realm. It's much easier to focus on the physical realm um, for a lot of people, uh, especially in our culture. But uh, there is the value of the sacred to keep in mind. This is a short video by Jonathan Morrow uh, talking about how to choose your own uh, worldview. And he gives some guidelines that I think are uh, valuable. And I think it's about a three minute video. We'll let you listen to that. is tell you about three questions you can ask in any worldview you come across. And these three questions will allow you to test it to see if it's worth following. But here they are. The first one is this. Is it rational? Does it make sense? Is it logically coherent? See, a postmodernist fails this test in this way. They make a claim there is no truth. But you turn around and you ask the question, well, is that true? And, and you have a fundamental contradiction at the core of, of postmodern thought. So that would fail that test. The second question you want to ask of a worldview is this, is it livable? Is it livable? Can I follow this worldview's teachings and practices and move with confidence out into the world? Eastern religions, for example, like Hinduism, say that evil is an illusion. But that's, that's a fundamental problem in the livability test because when we get out there, we know that evil is real. We run into it every day. So we want a worldview that makes sense of the world around us. And so that would be an example of a uh, worldview failing the test of livability. And finally, the third question to use when evaluating worldview is this, who says so? I mean, does this person, does this text, does this religious leader have the authority to make good on the claims that that religion's making? And so at the end of the day, Christianity should far outshines the other world religious leaders at this point, because you have a man, Jesus of Nazareth, who claimed to be God, and then you have evidence that he was God, by the, the historical evidence for the resurrection and that validated and vindicated those claims. So he would have the authority to speak and follow through and make good on the claims that he made. So here are the three questions you can use to evaluate any worldview. First, is it rational? Second, is it livable? And third, who says so? Uh, I think that is a nice little short summary of a way of looking at uh, a worldview and saying, you know, how valuable is this worldview? And of course, early Christians, the, their worldview was a Christian worldview and, you know, centered on Christ. And the, and as the Bible was being written, they would read those scriptures as they came out. And then as it was put together in the Bible, we 
the Christians have been following it ever since. And, uh, and so that's what informs our moral view. And, uh, and I think, uh, you know, to think about some of these questions is helpful to us uh, in making our commitment to uh, think like a Christian and follow the biblical worldview and so we can reach out to the world around us. Um, all right, so um, when we talk about the foundation uh, of Christian living and engagement, uh, we also want to talk about what Jesus calls the weightier matters of the law in Matthew 23. Uh, and these weightier matters, he said, are mercy, justice, and faithfulness. Uh, he states there in Matthew, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe mint and dill and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law. So he's saying, hey, you, church, you Jewish leaders, you're being hypocritical. You know, you want everybody to see you give all this, you know, uh, herbs and spices and things that are can be quite expensive. But he says, uh, you're really missing the more important things of the law, which are justice, mercy, and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting, you know, the giving you know, type of thing. And so we need to weigh in on what Jesus is saying about justice, mercy, and faithfulness as weightier matters of the law. And these do fall under the category of, you know, loving God and loving our neighbor. And so justice, acting on behalf of others for, for a right judgment. In other words, we want justice for people and uh, they want them to be treated uh, just. And so that has to do with our relationship with other people, uh, you know, that uh, Christians should be you know, some of the main ones pushing for justice in our world, which has a lot of injustice out there. And then uh, mercy, to show kindness, concern, love that responds to human needs in an unexpected or unmerited way. In other words, uh, uh, you know, how we treat people with kindness and concern and showing them love. Uh, and we're not expecting something in return where we do it because uh, they are God's people creating God's image. Yes, they may not live. Uh, according to God's will, they, uh, you know, they may have lifestyles that are wrong. Uh, they may not even believe in God, but that doesn't change how we should view them and treat them uh, as human beings. And uh, then faithfulness, uh, loyal, full of faith or trust. Uh, and this can be, you know, our relationship with God should be faithful. And we put our trust in him. Us now, and uh, you know, being committed to God and His will, uh, but you can also be faithful to other people. You know, you want to treat them like we've just said, but at the same time, uh, we we want to be faithful to how we treat them and how we see them as people creating God's image, and uh, that won't change because of circumstances. We will have that attitude of faithfulness. Um, to God, but in various ways, we show faithfulness to how we treat other people kindly, and we're faithful to that commitment. So I uh, I kind of put it like this in a pyramid shape um, here, uh, and down at the base, you have the way your marriage of the law, mercy, justice, faithfulness, the golden rule, doing to others you have them doing it to you, Two greatest commandments to love God, love your neighbor. Uh, and uh, on the very basis of the, the everything is humanity is created in the image of, of God and has intrinsic value in God's sight. And therefore, it should it, 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 people have intrinsic value in our sight as Christians. And then built on this, you live in Christ. Based on living in Christ, you have love for people, serve people, and you share Christ. And we'll be looking at each one of these as we go along. Uh, Romans 5, 8, Paul says, But God shows his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God's love for his creation is manifested even while we're not living the way we should. God still loves us. 
for you tithe mint and rue and every herb and neglect justice and the love of God. This is a variation on what was early on the way to your matters of the law uh, that we saw in Matthew. Luke puts it this way, neglect justice and the love of God, which uh, would include mercy and justice in it. And so uh, that's that's part of it. And then what we read in Matthew 23, justice and mercy and faithfulness are the way you are matters of the law. All right, so uh, we're going to uh, look at four keys to engaging the secular world. And we will only uh, look at the first one on this video and then uh, move to the other keys in the next uh, uh, video. But the four keys are first, like we said in the pyramid, live in Christ. In other words, represent Christ's attitude. Uh, love for people. Uh, practice sacrificial love. And then serve people. Treat them as people created in God's image. And then fourth, share Christ through spiritual and physical service. Now, I've included a video here from Oz Guinness and tell how the church engages in a post-Christian culture. Uh, very good video. It's 36 minutes long, so we're not going to play it in uh, this presentation, but it would be something that's well worth your time to, to look at. I will post it online as uh, something that uh, you can access it in the course uh, uh, website. So, uh, but those are the four keys. So we're going to look at the first key uh, here, and that is the living Christ, representing Christ's attitude. Uh, and we're going to just look at verses that uh, point this out. Uh, and so when we talk about having a biblical worldview, it really helps if we actually go and read the Bible and find out what it's saying. So uh, we're going to look at verses that help us to see clearly what it means to live in Christ, to represent Christ's attitude. Paul says in Romans 12, 18, if possible, so far as it depends on you, live in peace with all people, not just some people, but all people. Now, we can do that as Christians. We can live in peace, but some people will refuse to live in peace with us. The early Christians experience this. They lived in peace with the people, but they were persecuted. They didn't. The Roman authorities didn't want to live in peace with the Christians, and so persecuted them. Second Corinthians five fifteen, Christ died for all, so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for Him, Christ, who died and rose again on their behalf. We don't live for ourselves; we live for Christ. We're representing his attitude and what he wants, how he wants us to be, and how he wants us to interact with the world around us. Uh, Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. So, you know, by putting our faith in Christ, one way of saying it is that we've been crucified with Christ, but it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And so we're living in Christ, so Christ is living in us, so we can live in Christ. Uh, and uh, so we live that life through faith uh, in the Son of God. And uh, it showed us the love and gave himself for us. Beautiful passage. Now, Galatians 5.25, we live by the Spirit. For the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. We'll hit this one again uh, later on, but uh, notice living by the Spirit. And of course, you know, Spirit is the third person of the Godhead. And uh, so we're living in the Spirit, we're living in Christ. And then in uh, 1 Peter uh, 2, 24, Jesus himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you were healed. Live to righteousness. Live in Christ means we live to righteousness, to do what's right in God's sight and Christ's sight. And then the last one here, uh, Matthew 7, 
lives are built on Christ the rock. And uh, see this one here. Um, this is at the end of the Sermon on the Mount where God's, Jesus is giving instructions of, you know, how to have a committed life, one devoted to God, and you know, it's, it's several chapters long. But when he gets to the end, he gives this illustration. And he's saying, now, I told you a lot of things. He says, here's the important thing to remember. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rains fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and it slammed against the house. And yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against the house and it fell and great was its fall. When Jesus had finished these words, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, for he was teaching them as one having authority and not as the scribes. So a Christian biblical worldview yeah, we look to Jesus for guidance that says building, meeting the wise men, building your house on his teachings. And uh, when the hard times come, and it surely will, you know, we can withstand uh, that. But foolish man builds his house on the sand. That's the one that's not listening to Jesus' teaching. So we have to remember that having a biblical uh, worldview it means that we have to go to the source where God has revealed his will, which is, of course, the Bible. And uh, that indicates to us the direction we should be going and helps us to make the decisions in life or in the right way uh, based on, you know, Jesus' teaching and that foundational principle of humanity created the image of God. And the second greatest, the first and second greatest commandment Weigh your matters of law, golden rule, all of those things help to solidify that foundation we're talking about. So, um, God's love is manifested in Christian love. And the Bible says God is love. Uh, and then you have John 3 16, we mentioned earlier, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Uh, over and over again in scripture, God's love is made clear, but the whole aspect of the mission of Jesus revolves around God's love for his creation. You have the parable of the rebellious uh, son, uh, the prodigal son, uh, where, you know, he takes his inheritance and goes and squanders it and becomes a poor, comes back you know, thinking, you know, maybe he can just be a servant. He'll at least be better off than he is. But his father welcomes him back. And that parable is about God welcoming people back into a right relationship with him. And, uh, you know, so, uh, and we see this in uh, John 17, God, Jesus' high priestly prayer. The longest recorded prayer we have in Jesus. One of my favorite passages in the Bible is John 17. That, and you know, and Jesus says, I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. The love which God had shown Jesus will be in his followers. That's pretty amazing stuff. And so in Greek, you do have four words for love. In English, we're stuck with one word, which love candy i can love my wife she doesn't appreciate it if i uh, you know compare those two uh you know uh we we use the word love very loosely uh but in greek you have storge that's a kind of an empathy bond with somebody uh philea uh, a friendship kind of love and eros, this is a romantic or sexual type of love. Uh, that one actually doesn't even appear in the uh, Bible, uh, but it was common word in that time period too. And then, but the word used in uh, scripture the most uh, is agape, which is unconditional God love. And and this is the word that's often used when it's emphasizing, you know, how we should treat others, our relationship with God, and so forth. 
and uh, and it's a self-sacrificing type of love. Uh, it doesn't have, it doesn't do loving things in the expectation. Well, if I do this, I'll get something back from this person. And uh, so, uh, when we're talking about this kind of love as a foundational aspect of uh, our engagement with the world, we have to realize what we're talking about. All right, so what is agape love? And uh, uh, this is where we're going to end today, is love uh, can't be seen. You know, you can't, uh, you know, can't use a scientific method to prove love. But everybody really believes it exists. Uh, and uh, But we can see the results of love. We can see the results of how we care about other people by our actions. And uh, it's not simply an emotion. Uh, so often love, and particularly in media, so love is always shown as this emotion, but love is a commitment. It's, a, it's an attitude. Uh, and the Bible doesn't talk about it as if it's just emotion. Now, can, emotion can be a part of it, no doubt. But it is a characteristic of a person, an attitude that is developed. Right? Put my phone on silent, didn't I? And uh, so it's uh, not simply an emotion, uh, but a attitude and a part of our character. Uh, is uh, it's the same love God has for His people. So that same love that describes God's love for humanity is the same love we're told to have for humanity. And so we have to that that is part of that very strong foundation. So the definition, agape love is a commitment or attitude rooted in God uh, of self-sacrificing concern, care, and well-being for someone. And uh, so when we are talking about that as part of our outreach for people, we need to keep that in mind. Because the next key we're going to talk about is love for people. But we will put that off until uh, the next video. And uh, we'll get started there next time. And so I'll bid you uh, good day uh, on this video.